I'm Jordan with Evolve Design Build. And I'm Kyle with Evolve Design Build. And we are hardscapers. Jordan and Kyle, thank you so much for joining us here. And we are going to do round two of this and ask you guys, whoever wants to take it away, where did you know Evolve get its start? How did this all start? And can you give us a little bit of a background about the two of you? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. So um, it's kind of a long-winded story, but uh, I, I'm originally in EMS, fire and EMS by trade. That's what I went to school for. And um, here in our county, we work 24-hour shifts. So I was off three days a week. And long story short, my wife told me I was getting fat sitting around the house. And um, so I decided to start cutting the grass, just like you know everybody else that gets into this industry. And um, just found out that initially I had a huge passion for the entrepreneurship side of it, you know, meeting with clients, the growth, um, just experiencing new things. I think so many people take for granted the opportunities in our field. You know, they're, they're, they're almost limitless on what you can do. Yeah, you start out cutting grass, but you can branch out to so many other categories, you know? And so basically what, what happened, this has been 10 years ago, we started Curry Tuck Lawn Care, al almost 10 years ago now, we started Curry Tuck Lawn Care. And, um, my nephew was my first employee and he came on board with me. His name is JR. And then JR is now the um, manager of Curry Tuck Lawn Care. So we've created Evolve and I'll kind of talk about that a little bit, how Evolve came about. But JR now manages Curry Tuck Lawn Care. Uh, the company was continuing to grow and we were getting into landscape, uh, landscape design, hardscape, lighting, you name it, you know, you know, all the different, different categories, um, starting to get into a lot more commercial mowing. And, uh, before we knew it, we had about 20 employees, uh, in, in about a five year span. And some, some of which are still with us today, which is a real blessing. And basically, I'm sure you've been to the GIE, right, Mike? Have you had an opportunity to go to the no, GIE? No, I haven't yet. I'm hoping uh, maybe this year, but not yet. Awesome. Well, you'll enjoy it. Um, I think we've been about maybe five or six times. So we've been to the Northeast Hardscape Expo. I'm really big on education. So a lot of our guys have gone to take classes and get certified. ICPI, I think we had, what, five installers now, mm -hmm. Kyle? We have five certified uh, ICPI installers. We're real proud of that. And uh, so we would, we would go to these, you know, big shows and I talked to a lot of big name guys, guys that were, you know, at the time I thought I was, you know, doing a lot of annual revenue and these guys just made me look like a small potato, you know, I always had the trouble with differentiating a fine outdoor living, right? Because I don't know if you've ever seen our logo for Curry Tuck Lawn Care, but it is a goose pushing a lawnmower, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that sometimes people don't always associate that with fine outdoor living, right? They don't associate that with spending twenty-five dollars to $35,000 on an outdoor project. And we did our best through marketing and social media to, you know, build that brand. And I think we did a good job, but I always felt like it was limiting us. And then there was not a clear focus for me because I was focusing on, um, you know, all sides, the maintenance, the, I do, I do all my own drawings and designs. I'm sure you've seen some of my renderings on Instagram. So I'm all self-taught. <laughs> I can tell you even five years ago, I was flipping through plant catalogs by our local nurseries and just literally sitting in bed reading names. That's how I learned the, the, the plants, you know, and it would say the spacing or the size and what their needs were. And I would just go through and read those um, catalogs. And that's literally how I learned how to plant. And by no means do I think I'm a fantastic landscape designer, but I feel like I get by, you know? And then uh, Kyle uh, started working for Curry Tuck Lawn Care about three and a half. How long? Yeah, it's been about, been about three years now. About three, three years. Yeah. So, so Kyle came and started working for um, Curry Tuck Lawn Care, and we were really starting to get heavy into the uh, design and build at the time. And, um, I quickly realized, Mike, that um, Kyle's a lot better at hardscaping than me. <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, our skill sets are very different. He's super technical. I, I think it was challenging. I'm not going to lie at first. And, you know, I, I, I tell him all the time, you know, he came on the job site and I'd show him something. And next thing, next thing you know, he was doing it better than me. And I was like, whoa, well, we got a problem here, you know? <laughs> um, it really, it really made me feel like, uh, 
you know, it, it was challenging being being he's a younger guy and stuff like that. But he picked up the trade so quickly, and and um, as the years progressed, he worked under Curry Tuck Lawn Care, uh, and you know, I sent him and I went to numerous places. We've been where have been GIE, um, Belgard U, Belgard University. We 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 restarted out laying Belgard papers initially. Uh, we didn't know any better. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with Belgard, but I think um, you know it wasn't exactly what we were the quality, and we've won a won an award for a project we did with them, so we, we certainly don't want to hate on them, you know. But now you guys are Techo Block guys. Yeah, I mean, I gotta tell you, we do enjoy Techo Block, and our reps are fantastic. Uh, the thing is, Mike, I think a lot of people on Instagram get hung up on laying a specific brand, and um, I like that myself like I, this last six months I gotta tell you I, don't get me wrong we're techo pros I have nothing but good things to say but you're really putting a cap on your style when you start just going with a certain brand and and, and I think it's challenging because a lot of people especially with social media media in the market today get so even myself like I get so wrapped up in the fact that oh I gotta lay techo block or I gotta lay unilock and you know, the best thing I can give people advice is be creative, be yourself. When you're sitting down at that computer and you're drawing a project, if you see a porcelain you like, if you see a natural stone, you know, lay what you like, lay what you're feeling, you know, and I feel like the designs will showcase more of who you are. And um, I don't know if that makes sense what I'm saying. I certainly, I, I don't want anyone to think I'm advocating for just you know, not staying with a good brand and good vendors. But I think that part of being a designer is having the ability to change uh, on the fly of what, you, what you're laying, you know, because there's so many items out there and so many people doing it well. You really want to uh, build the best thing you can build, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think a lot of that begins with knowing what's out there. And uh you talked a lot about education and I want to kind of stick on this point a little bit because that's so important when it comes to not only building a business, but being in hardscaping and learning these technical aspects. Like you said that Jordan and uh, yourself, Kyle there, uh, both were learning and now you guys have, you said five certified ICPI installers. So obviously education is so important to you guys. Jordan, you said you were self-taught. Uh, let, let's stick on this a little bit. And I want to ask you, uh, when you when you say you're self-taught, then where did you, you know, what what resources did you reach out to to be able to teach yourself? And uh, what things did you tap into for, you know, for the guy listening out there that wants to get into this, wants to also be self-taught and teach themselves them skill, these skills? What resources did you tap into uh, for both of you guys to be able to learn your craft, to learn your skill? I think for me initially, you know, I'm not ever embarrassed to tell anybody I was super scared, like of doing the wrong thing. I think that there's also an aspect of the individual and your character and the fact that you don't want to give everybody a good job. I don't care if you're cutting grass or you're, you know, installing a light fixture or putting a paper patio. I was so scared to do a bad job that I just I was watching YouTube. And, and I got to tell you, the first person that I came across and I actually talked to Josh. Um, we talk on the phone quite regularly. Josh with Mass Hardscapes, Josh Jones. Um, do you know him? I know of him. Yeah, for sure. Through Instagram. Right. So Josh, before he's doing really well, he's killing it, man. The guy is, is on fire and he's super talented, great at business. Um, just a wealth of knowledge, especially, you know, for his age. But um, it was weird as an older guy watching him on YouTube. That was when YouTube was really starting to become, you know, a thing, right? It was, you know, it's been six, seven years ago and he was working by himself and I would just watch YouTube videos and, you know, just try to, I would write down notes and I would, uh, I would get so concerned about the wrong ways. And, and, and I remember even when I was putting in my first base and excavating, man, I was, a, I was going around and taking a measurement every, every foot, Mike, I was like, oh my gosh, I got to make sure this is perfect. I gotta, I gotta make sure uh, this is this screed rail is 110 percent, you know, ideal. I would check it five times because I was so concerned with giving the customer a bad product that I just wanted to, you know, do the best I could. And 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 I think now for the person starting out, the resources and and Kyle and I have talked about this. We recently uh, almond landscape, right? So they have a um, 
like uh, what is the name of that thing they have the how to install pavers and how to install retaining walls okay yes so kyle and i were talking about we were having this retention issue and i'm kind of getting off topic here so i apologize right so we were we were like we were bringing in these new guys we were bringing them in and we're just we were so busy and so overwhelmed we were just like throwing them in the field okay and i know i'm not talking about how i learned but i'm just kind of going hand in hand and we decided we said you know what let's buy that program that caleb has right let's buy this program and we bought it and it was like three hundred dollars it was it's so cheap it's ridiculous and the first thing we did before you even came out in the field we made them stay home their first days of employment watch the videos right okay and then give us documented notes on the videos that that was your assignment i mean everybody went to school we're not asking them to do anything crazy so we said go watch this video. We're going to pay you. We gave them eight hours of pay and we said, give us the notes. You know, here's a notepad, take notes. And we were, I was blown away. They came back. Uh, these, these, the first two guys we did it on, they came back with a page of notes and they soaked it up like a sponge. And I was intrigued by how willing they were to learn. And then, um, what transpired for us is we saw this huge shift where we're trying to explain what a screed pole is or, you know, go grab what I mean what's I don't know an example go grab such and such out of the trailer right the quickie saw and it'd be like you'd have to explain to somebody what this is or just the basic elements of them knowing because they saw it on a video I mean how many times have you watched a commercial one time but you can sing the jingle you know what I mean and so that for us really helps so I would say a lot of the new guys if you're not looking at that you know I that program or you're not trying to educate your guys and at least get them familiar with the tools that will really help you and 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 so for me i also i made a lot of boo-boos i i don't i don't mind telling you so the first patio i ever laid was on concrete okay because i was so scared of base failure i said well i'll just overlay it so i priced in to overlay it and i don't think there's anything wrong with that because the nice thing about it is i understand that certain areas you can't do that but here's the thing, if you can do the concrete overlay, you don't have to worry about walking on your screeds. You don't have to worry about messing anything up. You can move the pavers around. If you lay things, if you're learning patterns, you can pick them up, put them back down. It's a lot faster. And then uh, also when I started laying, I was doing using screenings because I didn't really know. I don't know what y'all call them up there, but um. I didn't know the difference. And yeah, is that concrete dust? That would be like stone dust, like the uh, the fines that don't let the water through. Yeah, so the so basically that like you'd see the flow issues and things yeah. like that. And we, we use stone dust, and I, I'm not gonna lie to you, I I love laying on stone dust. I, I don't, we don't advocate for that at all anymore. I just <laughs> I think it lays great. You know, it's easy to work with. Um, we obviously use all open graded now, but um. So I, so I made plenty of mistakes, but I think you just have to, you know, you have to go for it. You need to try to educate yourself. I mean, man, people are so quick to go out to a Mexican restaurant and spend $50, but you tell them to spend $50 on, you know, a class for themselves or go to a lunch and learn and take, you know, an hour away from their time building or working on a project. You could be making thousands more by educating yourself, you know? This is so true. And that investment, and I love your onboarding process where you're not throwing your workers into the deep end and, you know, making them feel stupid because they don't know the certain tool that they're getting out of the trailer or uh, there's such a large, huge learning curve. And the fact that you are willing to invest that initial, you know, eight hours for them to learn and to kind of come into the job site with a little bit of knowledge is so important to their confidence, but, you know, also staying with you guys as an employer. Uh, you also said that you have uh, five certified ICPI installers. Did you guys hire them as already certified or did you guys invest into them and, you know, put that money forward for them to go get their certification? Yeah. So, um, I, every single one, um, we gave incentive, you know, people in life, they need opportunity. You know, we thrive on that. You know, when you hire an individual and you just, you know, expect them to have everything or you expect them to perform the way you want them to, it's not going to happen unless you, like you said, invest in them. So actually, um, the five installers, every single one, we took the class. That was an incentive. Like, listen, stay with us six months. Let us teach you the trade. We'll send you to school. 
And, you know, if you pass it, we will pay for everything. And we put them up in a hotel. We put them up at the GIE. We took them around. We got them involved, right? And so, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not just the ICPI. Kyle holds PICPI. I hold PICPI. Kyle holds NCMA. I hold NCMA. Um, we have say we also have commercial installer, advanced installers. We've, I mean, I, we've all just we keep pushing education on them. The mind needs to be fed, and you can't expect your guys to get any better if you're not trying to be better yourself. So um, we did. We've invested all that money and sending them there. And people will be like, other contractors have told me they'll go, well, why do you need one more ICPI? installer well we don't but guess what we care enough about them to invest in them and allow them to thrive so as we have so that they feel like they're part of a team and create a good culture i mean that's i mean don't you think that's kind of where we're at with that absolutely and i think another thing that's important is uh we teach you know when we're out in the field and we tell them you need to excavate seven inches and we do four inches of base rock that that doesn't stick with them as well as when they you know learn why that's so important and i think understanding why each of the different you know things that we teach them uh is so important is uh what helps them to actually retain that information and put out a more quality product mm -hmm. and, and and to go mike what you know <laughs> kyle that makes a good point what kyle's saying so it's funny they'll hold you accountable mm -hmm. like we'll yeah. be doing stuff mike and they'll be like whoa 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 what are you doing here we're like listen this, this is that field experience don't worry about that you know <laughs> so um i mean you know we all need to be held accountable nobody's perfect so i think that's uh that's helped tremendously and and man don't be scared to invest in your guys you're talking about three four hundred dollars i mean so many of these guys on instagram are will go out and spend seventy thousand dollars on a brand new excavator and only one person on the crew can run it because they didn't teach anybody, you know, and educate them. And for three, $400 to send somebody through a class that understands the basic mechanics of paper land, that'll pay for itself in a week. Yeah, absolutely. And Kyle, coming back to you, I mean, obviously you came into this company, I think you said it was three years ago. Um, did, was this education, this kind of culture of education, was it really apparent to you? Is that why you kind of uh, sunk your teeth into this company and are, are still around? Yeah, absolutely. And when I when I joined, I was actually just fresh out of high school. I was really only looking for uh, summer work, really. But um, just I enjoyed what we were doing and just seeing the, the culture of education and uh, uh, seeing the opportunity to grow and uh, learn and actually get to install, you know, a good quality outdoor living product really is why I'm still around. That's what helped me stick around and, uh, you know, get the chances that I've had so far mm -hmm. I, I think it's such an important thing uh for your business this this education and investing into your employees jordan but also for our industry because there's no uh you know everybody knows there's a labor shortage it's, it's tough to get labor it's tough to keep labor but if you're investing into your employees and you're investing into their education they're going to stick around. And not only is this good for your company, but it's also good for the industry. Yeah. And in, in the prime example, kind of, you know, circling back and not to beat the issue to death, but, you know, Kyle made a good point, right? So, you know, he, he didn't know necessarily that he wanted to install pavers or outdoor living spaces. Right. And he is a very a rare, um, he's, it's rare that he happens to be so technically good at this, you know, especially, coming from, you know, such a short background in the field initially. But um, he goes back on, I gave him the opportunity, right, to go see if he enjoyed this by educating him. And now I consider him twice as good as me in the field. I mean, I, I you know, there's obviously some things that he'll run by me. We're a team, you know, and I felt like uh, we were better together. Um, I'm certainly – and, and I'm not, I, he may disagree, but I feel like I'm more on the creative end and the design end and I'm, you know, good with the customers and the sales. But when it comes to the field, we, I, when I came and offered him an opportunity to come on board and be a partner, I, I had given him that opportunity and that foundation and saw how good he was. And I recognized that it's okay that one of the guys is better than you. You don't have to be the best installer you can thrive off one of your employees or in this case your partner and it will allow your company to grow that much better like we have literally 
been doing better than we've ever done sales. Our numbers are better because Kyle's in the field and he is a better installer than me. And, and then he, the part that I'm good at, I'm staying, I'm designing more, we're closing more jobs. Um, I'm focusing on products, quality, uh, customer relations. It just makes the business that much more well-rounded. So, you know, I guess what I'm saying is don't be scared to hire people or uh, people that are getting better than you in the trade. That, that's what you want, man. That's what everybody wants is to have somebody that they can feed off, you know? Yes, absolutely. And you talked about sales there. So let's get talking about your sales process. Um, obviously, since you've evolved uh, into Evolve <laughs> from Curatech Lawn Care, your uh, way you acquire clients has probably changed. Can you talk about, you know, in those beginning stages, changing from Curatech to Evolve? Did your process of acquiring clients change? Like where, where did you get your leads from when you were starting this, uh, this change into uh, being a design build company? Yeah, so um, I, this is a funny story. I'm on the bus at the GIE, okay? We had, caught, we had to go back to the hotel. I'm, I'm sitting on the bus and um, this, I, start, I had to sit in a seat by somebody I didn't even know. Um, and I sit next to this guy and I'm telling him, t- telling him about how, yeah, I got this maintenance company, Curry Took Lawn Care, but we really love outdoor living and um, we really want to try to push into that. He's like, oh, well, let me, let me, uh, let me tell you what I did. And so he goes on this story about telling me about how he had a maintenance company and he separated it and he hired a general manager. He's like, listen, my heart just wasn't in that at the time. He's like, it was a profitable business. It was great. And we needed that foundation to refer our outdoor living customers to, right? We needed a good, solid company. We could say, we built this for you and here's the people that can maintain it. Okay. So I said, all right, well, you know, tell me more about this. So literally 30 minutes on the bus, we get off the bus. We happen to be at the same hotel, another hour in the lobby. This guy's just spreading this wealth of knowledge on me about how he split his company. And he goes, well, you know, we just kind of evolved. And I was like, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to evolve. Like, you know, we've become different. Uh, Our goals are different. Our our ideal customer is different and that's okay that we started with those three to $5,000 patios. It's okay that we did a 200 square foot with one fire pit, but that's not where we're going. You need to know where your destination is, you know, and then, you know, basically start the journey from there. And so that was when I came back and I, and I was talking to my wife and I just said, you know what? Uh, I want to do something different. I want to bring Kyle on board and we want to, you know, we want to evolve the company. So, As soon as we did that, I think it would have taken like maybe three months for us, Mm -hmm. Kyle and I were going through the process. I went to my G, my, at the time he was not my GM, JR, and he um, has been with me and I offered him the position of GM and I was just so confident he could handle it. He started handling all the Curry Tuck lawn care. I shifted my direct attention to what I wanted to do and me and Kyle focused on our ideal client. And as soon as we changed our brand, it was, wouldn't you say that like the way the jobs just started showing up because of the branding alone, it fit the bill for what people were looking for. We put Mm -hmm. stickers, we bought our trailer, put the Evolve stickers on and how many, I mean, how many people walked by that first job site when we did that? I mean, like maybe six, seven. A a ton of customers just waiting to be had. Yeah. Just waiting in the design build. I remember telling Kyle, I was so overwhelmed because people saw, they didn't see Curry took lawn care with a goose. Right. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. They saw evolve design build. It put us in a different class, man. And it just, the clients that were calling were, were not the people looking to spend five to 6,000. It, it looked like, and we knew we were, it looked like we were capable of 50 to a hundred thousand dollar jobs if that makes sense you know just the image alone yeah and obviously that was a uh very deliberate thing on your guys part you invested into that branding right and um can you speak a little bit about the importance of branding because obviously you see that obviously you uh you saw that the goose wasn't going to portray your company as the company that you wanted it to be. So, you know, what, what advice would you give to somebody about branding in terms of being able to 
put some money aside to invest into that, to get a new logo made, to to uh, dress up your trailers, to dress up your people with shirts, whatever it may be. What advice would you give about that? The first advice that I, or the first, I guess, first advice, the first thing I'm going to say is um, don't be scared. Okay. I was nervous, man. I was just nervous as something new. I had established this rapport with Curry Tuck Lawn Care and I was so nervous about switching. So for the guys that are thinking about switching, don't be concerned. It, your work ethic and your thought process and rebranding, take the time and figure out how you want to portray yourself. It will pay off. Okay. It will pay off, period. Secondly, I, I was at, um, uh, let's see, it was Teco Showcase. Okay. We go to Teco Showcase every year. And I'm going to butcher his last name, but this guy, Alex, he's like in charge of marketing. Alex Kukeda or I, you? I, I don't know. Is that, is that what it, I knew I was going to butcher his name? So I apologize <laughs> if he's listening. So I'm taught, I, I just happened to bump, in, bump into him and he tells me about the book of why. Have you ever heard about this book? No, I don't know that book. Okay, I'm going to have to probably pull it up on my um, uh, Audible, right? So anyway, the book is called Why and um, or How to Get Why. I'll have to, I'll have to message you and tell you the book name. Yeah. But uh, not, to, not to mess up the, you know, butcher my whole conversation here. But anyway, it, the book, you need to read the book. Before you rebrand, or before you even start anything, you need to read the book about why. And literally, it talks about all these companies knowing, not knowing why they were doing something, right? So if you don't know why you're doing something, if you just say, I'm going to, um, yeah, it is literally, Kyle just pulled it up. So it's literally called The Book of Why. And it is one of the most phenomenal books I've ever read. And the fact that it explains to you why, what is your why, essentially. So Mike, if you were like, my why is to build the best outdoor living space that money can build. Okay, that might be your why. My why is to give people a place for thriving outdoors with their family and getting into the, you know, getting into the outdoors. It just talks about all these companies that have figured out what their why is, why they do things, and that helps build the brand. They know what they're about. They know why they're doing it. You can't just say, well, this logo looks really cool. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an awesome looking logo. It's, you know, got all this fancy lettering and I got this really cool name, like Spitfire Pavers or something. I, I'm just making that up, right? You got to figure out what is your why. And when we figured out what our why was, well, our why for us was to evolve ourselves and people's way of using the outdoors. We wanted to evolve their spaces into a space that they could come out be with their family and other people saw it and it was incredible. They were like, wow, look at this. We just evolved this entire backyard. So it was to give them an environment to thrive outside. That was our why, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then Kyle, what does that mean to you that, you know, you're pulling up to these job sites with this, uh, this nice, you know, sticker trailer with this beautiful design and you know, that you guys are, uh, I don't know if you guys have company shirts or whatever, but what does that mean to you that, you know, Jordan's willing to invest into that branding to you guys on site? Uh, it absolutely means a lot. We, uh, when we started the business, we put uh, a lot of money into our branding and into, like you said, the shirts. We've got apparel for our guys, both regular shirts, and we actually have some nice Nike polos that we got for everyone. Um, with their names on it and they are um, for the guys that means a lot because that's you know that shows we're investing in them and that I think helps definitely with our you know retention and keeping our employees happy and uh, that helps them you know work better and uh, put out a better product but uh, I think the branding is very important not just for the customer but also for the employees to see um, and to have something they can be proud of coming into work every day and uh working for a company that they um, are proud to work for. And uh, so that's important. And um, like I said, uh, the branding is, uh, I think, essential to culture. culture. Exactly, culture. Um, and I've seen a big difference with our guys being a lot happier on the jobs um, since we've you know switched over. They're a, part, they're a part of something. We've basically, I mean, we... When we started up, Mike, we, we spent $5,000 on apparel and branding right out of the gate, right? And, and people are like, whoa, that's crazy, right? And I'm not saying everybody has that to do that, right? We had obviously been in business for a little while. 
But the thing is, we created an identity for them. And, and, and I'm not advocating that people should um, say work is their identity, right? We don't, we don't want that, right? But when you have a passion for a field and you, those are the type of employees you want, you want them to share that same passion because they're going to build better. They're going to uh, show up every day. They're going to put their best foot forward. And we created that. We wanted it, like Kyle said, the Nike shirts. You know, somebody would think we were nuts for spending, what was it, 50 some dollars on a Nike shirt. Mm-hmm. But guess what? They're dry wick shirts. When you put them on, you look like a million dollars. And the customers see that. That was the image we wanted to portray. We wanted our guys to pull up and we look like, you know, the men in black, if you've ever seen that movie, you know. Yeah. Uh, we look like professionals. And, and our guys, the, when we gave them all that apparel and we had jackets made, custom jackets, we had, you know, everything. Uh, we knew that that was an investment, but that wasn't just an investment in the company, it was a investment in why our identity, you know, and if you don't know your identity and why you're doing something, then what good is, you know, every paper that you lay down, you know? Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, it's one thing to talk about culture, to say this is our identity and whatnot, but taking that action and actually putting your money where your mouth is and uh, showing the people in your company that you are willing to uh, you know, take that action to show them what the culture is and what the branding is behind Evolve is obviously so important to you and to you guys as a company. Yeah, no doubt, man. It's a, it's a big deal for both of us. And I, and I think we're very fortunate that we share some of the, some of, some of the same ideas. Excuse me. I think that was you know, a lot of the reason, you know, we came on board together. We felt like we were better together and our, and our goals were the same. So absolutely is. So, so when somebody, a lead comes in, somebody contacts you, where do you take that from there? However, they may contact you by phone, text, email, uh, where do you take that initial lead and, you know, how soon do you get back to them? Um, how important is that to you? And what do you talk about in that first initial conversation? Yeah. Um, I'm probably going to nerd out on the whole sales process because I'm. This is big for me, right? So I, I want to apologize in advance for uh, nerding out on this. But um, so uh, you know, Kyle is, you know, we're we're big on vetting leads right now. Um, but I want to I want to talk about there. There's two ways of thought process with that, right? So we have an office manager. If you call in, you know, Kyle and I do not speak with our customers. I know there's a lot of customer. I mean, a lot of companies that you know they talk to the owner right away, right? You call into our office manager and, you know, she does do a little bit of vetting. We, we have a minimum, um, which we even before we even go out, um, we do not charge for a consultation. And I'm going to tell you, there is nothing wrong with charging for a consultation. But what people need to realize is there's a difference between having a guy like myself that is able to go on every sales lead. Right. Because Kyle is in the field. It's very challenging when I was starting Curry Tuck Lawn Care to be in the field every day, it's 90 degrees and you want to go on a lead at the end of the night, right? So you may need to vet your leads in a different way because you can't get to everybody, right? So it's more critical to um, vet your leads or maybe charge for a consultation if that makes sense. With us, I do all the design work. I work in the field when I can, um, which this year has not been much because we're so busy. But I try to go on every lead that I can. We certainly have our office manager vet them to make sure they have a minimum budget. Like we, we really can't go to any house for less than thirty five hundred dollars. We just we just can't. I mean, mobilization alone, there's just no way. Um, now, we're not going to tell you that if somebody calls up and, you know, they're two minutes from our shop, we can go down there for a one day or for, you know, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars. Right. Um, but typically we find out what their budget is. Our office manager does, and she puts everything in our calendar In my calendar. I've got their email. They go into the system. She sends them a confirmation email. Um, be very professional. Make sure you schedule um, everything. And if you have a way of notifying your clients that you're coming or when their appointment time, we try to get back to them within 24 hours and we try to see them that week, you know, make sure that your, your communication is, is critical with that process because that, that right there shows them that you're serious. Okay. And then uh, it, once I go out to the lead, because I'm able to go to every lead, right? So I, I try to educate them right out of the gate. Um, the first thing I do is I want to, you know, listen to them. Shut your mouth. I know that sounds crazy. Shut your mouth and listen to them. I have been to so many daggone 
meetings with other contractors and friends and they just want to tell them what they want to do. Trust me when I tell you, they don't, you, they, you, you're going to have to tell them. You're going to have your opportunity to tell them and design the project for me. I promise you. But listen to them, especially the wives. They want to tell you why they want the space, what they're trying to achieve. By listening initially, you'll gain so much information and be able to engage back with them in conversation about their project. They want to feel involved. They're getting ready to invest fifteen, twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars. Make it feel like an experience for them, Mike. You know, and if they if they're not, the other thing is too is like catalogs. I see so many contractors, and I and I know I'm nerding out on the service, the uh, the sales process. Taco Block, Unilock, whoever you're using, they're giving you free catalogs by the buckets. Every single lead, I don't care which one, give out your two vendors. I personally believe in having two products. We uh, push for Taco Block and Marmira Stones. We feel like it's a good contrast, right? We've got the travertine and then we've got the pavers with the Taco Block. Give, you know, give them that education. Give them the literature. A lot of times will be like, people will be like, oh, nobody brought these. Nobody gave me these. Well, right there, you're already ahead of your competition. And if you went to your supplier and you said, I'm going to give you Techo Block, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get on 150 doorsteps a day, I mean, a, a year by giving out your catalog, they're going to go, man, that sounds great, you know? Um, and the other thing is with those catalogs, they get passed around. I cannot tell you how many times I went to a sales call and three days later, I got called to the neighbor's house because the lady looking at my catalogs decided to give them to her next door neighbor, you know? Yeah. So, so, so right when you go out, right, you need to give those to them and, and don't, and just load up on them, man. Don't, and you know, I, I tell you, my rep will tell you, I, I hit them up for catalogs hardcore constantly. I bet I give out 250 catalogs a year and that's no exaggeration. And then the second thing is I'm big on the sample books. We have the sample books. When Teco came out with that, that was a big deal on um, being able to show them uh, the product. And, and what I'll say about the samples is, you know, keep in mind, you're designing the space from them. That goes back to the listening. Do they need to pick their paper out right now? I hear so many guys say, well, I'll take measurements, let them look through the book. Do That's a good thing. I don't want to say do not do that, but in, in give them homework. And what I mean by that is have them email you back their style. Say, hey, here's the books. Let's Let's have you pick a few styles you like and email me back and tell me what you liked out of the catalog. And right there, you're vetting your lead. If you don't get an email back from them, they're not serious. Anybody that's interested is going to email you back. Okay. And with that being said, respond quickly after that meeting, asking for that information. Hey, Mrs. Smith, I enjoyed meeting with you, you know, maybe 24 to 48 hours later. Did you have an opportunity to turn through those catalogs and see some of those products that you liked and they're going to if they don't respond back guess what you vetted that lead and with that being said we don't even start um a design until we we have a design contract and um i actually stole mine from jeremy uh swihart with uh j squared uh him and i are good friends and i and he has the best design contract i've ever seen so i will give him 100 percent credit on that so um i don't even give you a quote unless you're willing to pay for a drawing Okay, because I can't, how can anybody give anybody a price on anything without a plan? I mean, that'd be like going to the car dealership and walking in there and saying, give me a red car. Well, mm -hmm. you want the one with power windows? You want the one with a heated steering wheel? What do you want? How can you give me a price on it? You know, uh, and I explained that to the customer that, you know, you want to have, I want to give you the best value. I never, I never tell people I'm going to be the cheapest. I, will, I tell them that I want to give them the best value. And in order to give them the best value, I need to make sure we have a plan to go off that fits all their needs and their budget. You know, do you ask them their budget? Yeah. So absolutely. Like I, that's another thing. Like we won't, I don't draw and this takes time, man. You can't like when I was first starting out, I don't want people to think that like I had it figured out because I was nervous, man. I was nervous as can be. I'd be like, Oh, I want to ask them their budget. They're going to tell me no. Listen, if you don't know their budget, it's not helping anybody. It's not helping them because you're going to spend all this time drawing a project. And this was before we even charged for designs. We've only been charging for designs uh, maybe, what, a year and a half. And, I mean, we just, this year alone, I bet we've sold maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 in designs. And, and, and typically, most designs were only charging $250, $300. But I just sold one for $1,500. I sold one for $1,800. 
that that's going to weed them out right there too, like the design fee. But I don't even draw without a budget. People will be like, well, I don't have a budget. No, trust me, you have a budget. Everybody has a budget because if I told you, well, I can give you, how about 400,000? You go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you know? So don't even leave there. And there's a way to ask, be respectful. Don't step on their toes. Don't be little people. Don't, you know, whether their budget's five, whether their budget's 10, that's fine. You don't, you don't need to go, well, oh, you can't have all those things for that budget. The first thing I would recommend is if they tell you they got a $5,000 budget, but they tell you they want a fire pit and a seat and wall and 300 square foot of pavers. Well, you and I both know that's a hard budget to work with, right? Like, but with that being said, show them what their budget can get them after you've acquired that design fee and then show them what they want and where that budget is. That goes on educating your client. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And you also talked about uh, leaving them with a catalog. Do you ask questions in that initial meeting to kind of get a sense of what paver you might want to lean them towards or what style of paver, retaining wall, whatever it may be that you want to lean them towards and kind of uh, dog ear those pages for them so that they can take a look at that? Or do you just let them kind of browse through and, and then shoot a shoot a style that they like back to you? Personally, I, I don't do that unless they tell me they have a like a lower budget. Like for instance, if they have a lower budget, I will tell them like, you know, Eva, I'll be like, I'll dog your Eva or something like, um, you know, Parisian or something cheaper, right? I will dog your, and, and I never say cheaper. I say economical. Okay. I say, here's an economical paper for you or whatever, you know, you know, something that I don't like to use the word cheaper because I don't want to devalue our service. We do nothing cheap. Okay. And what I mean by that, it's our work. It's our quality of paper we choose. There's nothing cheap about them. It is just a lesser value. You know, I don't, I don't do the paver dog ear and thing because clients you shouldn't really, you should get a sense of their style and design according to their style. In my opinion, I don't think that necessarily you should design based around their paper. It doesn't allow you to free think as much. And those, those are just my opinions. Mike, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Like saying somebody wants Borealis, right. Or Copthorn, which is what's that, you know, like we, I love, I think that's such a cool paper. Like I don't see how people can't like Copthorn, you know, but the problem is I feel like you should show them what you can offer. And then once you have the design, the lines, the structure, the look, the papers are click away and changing them. Does, does that make sense? You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then with that initial meeting, so maybe they email you back, they've sent you a couple uh, styles that they like from the catalog. You understand what their budget is. You know what you want to design into that. That design is out there. Um, how do you close that customer from there? Do you set up a meeting to show them the design? Do you just send them over to the de design? You know, where do you take that, that final uh, closing? So I start my close a little different than most people. I close my job the first time I'm at the job. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. So I create an experience, okay? I'm not just in and out of there in 30 minutes. While I'm there, I'm put, I put my drone in the air. I take aerial pictures. I explain to them why we're doing that. Just, show, just pulling a drone out of your truck and spending 15 minutes to take photos. It's an experience. People don't see that. There are not contractors showing up with a drone to take pictures of their house. They're like, oh, what's that? Oh, well, I want to give you the best um, you know, experience. Let me get all these angles. Let me put it up there. Let me scale this drone in my software look like a professional start closing the job the minute you're there they need to feel confident in you i take them out to my truck i explain to them a through mix i explain to them a face mix i show them the cutaways of the pavers i kill them with education close the deal before you leave okay because the next contractor mike that comes behind you i can guarantee he doesn't have cutaways he doesn't know the difference between through and face mix he's not putting a drone in the air and he's not leaving two catalogs when you do that the confidence level skyrockets you're going to find out that when you ask for that 250 dollars $300, have your contract printed up right there pull it out explain to it don't go right to the price explain the contract do all those fancy things with your drone show them the cutaways that contract will sell itself and as soon as you get them locked in for that contract the odds of you getting that job just dramatically increase by 75 to 90 percent because when they give you that check before you leave they already know you're the guy for the job because you killed them with education and you explain the process and they're going to feel comfortable 
spending twenty to thirty thousand dollars with you because you know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Man, and and obviously that starts with vetting the customers before you go out there. Because if you're doing that with for somebody that's maybe not too serious, it's a waste of your time. But obviously, you guys vet your clients. You go out there and you put on a show for them, and that's that's what I've been kind of trying to preach is that you know um just that you know that drone idea is such a cool idea to be able to show that off to them but something as simple as having a zip level on you and whipping that out because so many guys do not do that that the customer asks hey what's that oh nobody ever did that to me Uh, nobody nobody ever took the elevations before nobody ever took measurements like this before you're putting on a show for them and like you said you're selling them right out of the gate that you know you are the professional you are the one to to go with yeah, exactly. And the zip level, I have that in my truck. Like we love the zip level. Matter of fact, you know, we want to get Kyle one, but we use, he uses the transit, you know, on site with the zip level. You, you make a great point that, and that's a low investment tool to have and you pull it out and they're very curious. People want to understand the process. And, um, and then going back to closing, like, listen, I, we're not perfect. I'm not going to try to tell you we close every lead, but we're very confident after, you know, in, in our sales process, which makes them feel comfortable. And, you know, unfortunately, due to our uh, demographics and our locations, we email a lot of our designs, right? Because we've already got paid for them. And after the vetting process, like you said, that's critical, right? Um, but we, it's hard for us necessarily. Uh, we can be, our shop can be in the middle of an area that we can be servicing an hour north and an hour south and an hour west. Um, excuse me, east. <laughs> uh, so so there's, there's issues with us as far as that. So we email a lot. I send them a nice email. I always try to put in the email to be as direct as you can with your comments, because it is my goal to give you the best possible outdoor living space. And I want you to be able to feel comfortable telling me something you don't like, you know, so I can change it. So, you know, just letting them know and giving them a deadline of when you're going to have that drawn done. That's, that's critical. People want to hold you accountable when they feel like they can hold you accountable. They're more apt to spend money with you. So we always give them a deadline of when we'll have it prepared for them, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And getting into the payment plans with your customers, do you have specific payment plans that you try to stick to, or do you uh, kind of tailor that to the specific project? Like how much upfront, how much when the material arrives, how much at the end, whatever it may be, what are your payment plans like? Uh, so we, um, we do a uh, 10% just to book the job. So that was something that was huge for us. Uh, I was really scared to do that. I'm not going to lie. I was like, Oh, well, we'll just put you on the schedule. No, you don't even go on the schedule anymore unless you put 10% down because they need to have something invested as because you're taking the risk to put them on your schedule. I mean, and, and that for me has been huge. So we'll get 10%. Don't go spending the money. Don't go do anything. Put it to the side. Act like you didn't even get it, you know. And then the week before the job starts, we have to have 40%. Um, so, you know, it obviously is going to vary state to state. I don't know what everybody's rules is. But by the time the job starts, we have 50%. Now, we do not do a draw. And we've done projects that are, I don't know, 150, 200,000. I'm not advocating for people to not do a draw. We've set up ourselves financially where we feel like once we get 50%, we can continue to, you know, progress through the job. And that's how we prefer to do it. I, I don't know that that's necessarily good for new contractors. Um, and then we have, so then once the job's complete, we give you 48 hours to walk the job and see if there's anything you want us to do. And we expect payment in full at that time, unless there's something we need to fix. Also, uh, I'm sure you've heard, uh, what does Techo Block call it now? Um, paid now, pay later. You're right. You're right. familiar with that? Yep. So I think that's really good, especially if you're a Techo Pro and you have that financing. Um, we did take that a step further. We were using Belgar's version of that, which was the same bank. And I actually went to them and I said, look, here's the deal. We want to be able to use the products we want to use. We want to be able to finance somebody regardless if they want Techo Block or Bellguard. So we went through the whole process this year of getting vetted through Interbank to sell any product. And so we can offer 0% for 24 months and 6.99 for 60 months. Of course, these rates, you know, do change and we can do any product. We don't just, um, 
we didn't, I don't like to isolate myself to letting somebody else dictate what my <laughs> earnings are going to be or who I can use. I want to, you know, try to make it so I'm in control of that. So we did that. And I would say that uh, maybe 35 to 35% of our clients will use that financing. And it's not necessarily for the entire project. Uh, I don't think that we get a lot of leads where people see our financing and they're like, oh, okay, we'll just finance it. A lot of times it's if we show them a project that's above their budget, they'll take the 0% for 24 months or 18 months. They'll pay down, let's say, 70% of the project and they'll do the other amount with the financing. So I, I have seen that help drastically. And then getting into another uh, story, do you, in terms of payment plans, in terms of selling, in terms of you know, even on the job site with Kyle, whatever it may be, do you guys have any horror stories that you'd want to share that would help, you know, us in the industry, us who maybe haven't, haven't experienced the same problem to uh, put in safeguards to maybe try to avoid those, those horror stories. Do you have something like that, that you'd want to share? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we've, I think that everybody's got their fair share. You know, I, we actually have, I, I'll go two ways on this. So we've messed things up ourselves. Like I think Kyle, I'm going to call him out. He hit a power line and it was in his defense, it was marked poorly. Okay. <laughs> so we've had incidents happen on jobs where, you know, we've had to make repairs and things like that. Don't be ashamed, man. I'm not, I, don't be dangerous and reckless. Right. When it, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is things are going to happen on your job. I, I hear so many people on here, say, well, you know, you got to make sure you have everything in writing with your client. And that's critical. I do have a horror story about that. We had a client that we had a huge project for about $65,000. To us, that's a good size project, you know, $65,000, right? And the client was in the travel industry. So he traveled a lot. And we have a change order form that we started because of this job. We didn't do change order and I'm just too nice of a guy. I would say, okay, you want to add that? Well, it's X amount of dollars, right? Um, and so this gentleman was traveling and we had exchanged several phone calls where something would come up and we'd say, sometimes you recommend like, hey, I think this would look better if we brought this up maybe one more course and faded this hill in. Or if we added this a little more square footage, we could make this curb. I'm sure you've had similar situations, right, Mike? Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, basically we were doing all these add-ons. It was about $5,000 worth of add-ons. We didn't have any documentation really other than on the phone. He got back in town and he, we had our last meeting. He was happy as pie about the job. And I mean, there was no indication of anything was wrong. We were ecstatic. It looked great. Uh, I had, went down to go get payment. He sends me, slides me a check across the desk for the end of the initial balance. And so uh, it didn't include any of the extras. I said, okay, are you gonna cut the check separately for the extras? Cause I had made that invoice separate. Oh no, 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 I'm not gonna, no, mm -mm. we didn't agree to those. I said, well, we had many discussions about these extras and we did all these things for you and you're very happy with the job. Well, here's the deal. If you want to take the check now that I'm giving you, you can take it or you can take me to court and we'll settle this court with the documentation that I owe you that money. Now, that's a really crummy thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's a character issue in my opinion. We did not end up going to court because it, it was $5,000, but I'm gonna be honest with you. We were, I was so bitter and so frustrated and I just didn't even see it coming. I just wanted to get my money and leave. Now, a lot of people may say that that was stupid. That was not responsible, but what was not responsible was me not getting a change order form that was what was not responsible. And I didn't hold myself accountable uh, for my own financial um, liabilities. And so I, I put that blame on myself. Uh, and to this day, we still struggle with that. We struggle with getting change order forms done because we feel like, you know, we try to build a relationship with our customers, but do not, do not do extras without change order forms. You've got to, I know it's uncomfortable sometimes and you feel like you got the best customer in the world and we've worked for some phenomenal clients, but the only person that's going to look out for you is you. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be my recommendation as far as that's concerned. Otherwise, listen, <laughs> don't worry about messing things up on a job. When I say don't worry, don't be reckless, but things happen. I, I Kyle was running a job one day and we were almost done with the job and it went great. 
And I said, he had to be somewhere. So I came in to kind of fill in. I wasn't even there two hours and I knocked the electrical meter off the house, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and the customer was like, well, Kyle, I didn't have any problems. And you came in here two hours and you knocked the electrical meter off. I'm like, well, you know, that thing's got a little hairy, you know? <laughs> so those things happen. All this Instagram stuff, you know, looks great, right? People are doing these stories, but trust me when I tell you, like, every day things are happening. Don't be ashamed. It's part of the growing and learning process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's just great to hear different stories, different situations, because we all get into them and it's just great to, especially for those just starting out in the industry to be able to hear these things and say, you know what, I should implement this because I think everybody starts off not doing change orders or not doing documentation. Everybody starts off, customer says uh, they want to change something and yeah, yeah, it'll be like a little bit more, it'll be this much. And uh, just like verbal communication, but the sooner you can change to written documentation, change order forms, the better it's going to save you uh, because there is going to be t uh, time that comes up like in your situation where it backfires, definitely. Yep, no, absolutely, it's critical. Uh, in terms of installation, uh, maybe Kyle, you, you can speak on this, uh, any, any products, any tools, fab, uh, any, anything in particular on a job site that you want to speak about that you are a huge advocate for, whether that's an installation method, installation technique, a tool that you guys just got, or a piece of equipment that you just got, or going to invest in in the future. Cause you are a big advocate for it. Anything like that, that you'd want to talk about. Well, it's hard to talk about just one thing. We're, we're very big on, on uh, equipment that helps not only increase our efficiency, but helps make it easier on our guys and uh, avoid, you know, wearing them out. Um, we, you know, we believe a lot in the uh, open graded base system um, and we use GeoGrid, obviously, and GeoFabric on all of our installations. We just believe it's cheap insurance. And we have seen, uh, since we started using open graded base uh, about a year or two ago, we've seen that it helps not only, um, I think gives us a, gives our clients a better product, but it also helps uh, avoid, you know, missing time because of rain. Um, so that's been huge for us is switching to open graded base. But I think even more than that, um, our, our equipment that we buy is, uh, is, is really the only thing I think that's more, uh, you know, more important is our employees and keeping them happy. And, uh, that's uh that's a big part of that so we have uh we have uh, a lot of equipment we've got we just invested in a new um mini skid steer uh the uh, ditch switch uh, 1550 which um is really uh, a great machine we have the uh, bobcat mt85 um which is a great little mini skid steer but we just found it didn't lift uh lift enough for us and so we tried the uh, the ditch switch 1550 and it's able to pick up most pallets of our uh, pavers, our wall block and whatnot without any issues. And um, it's great because a lot of our guys are a little hesitant to get in the, uh, the full size skid steer. It's a, it's a bit of a learning curve, but the, uh, the, the mini skid steers that you can uh, ride behind, we just find that it's a lot easier for our guys to learn to operate those. And we think that the more time our guys spend on equipment and the less time they spend moving stuff by hand, the more efficiency we can get and the uh, um, better we can save them from overworking themselves or injuring themselves because we want our guys to be around for the long haul. We have a running joke, you know, we're allergic to shovels, <laughs> you know, we, we don't even know. We don't where people will come in and, you know, be like, you know, we're on another job site or we'll see another contract. Like, you guys got a shovel? And we're like, what? what what's a shovel? <laughs> we don't, you know, nobody wants to dig with a shovel. Don't get me wrong. You know, there's times you got to, but I mean, Kyle, we've got a ton of paved tool stuff. Um, we've got minis, we got buggies. Um, we pretty much have a piece of equipment for every employee. <laughs> yeah. At least. Uh, and I think we're seeing a big trend with that. I mean, with people having less employees and more equipment, um, you would agree with that. Absolutely. And then, uh, you know, you got a lot of the paved tool stuff. I mean, you use a lot of that for your measuring anything in particular. Yeah. Jordan's a big, uh, big paved tool guy. He can't go to any of the expos or any of the, uh, the different events that we go to without buying, you know, at least one or two new tools from them. But, uh, mm -hmm. we, we definitely find their stuff to be very helpful. And, uh, 
it's it's great to have somebody that uh, like Pave Tool understands the uh, importance of you know having the right tool for the right job. So um, we use the uh, of something I find myself using a lot is just something as simple as their uh, compass and their sidewalk measuring tool. The uh, the tool that can extend and you can use it to measure a radius or to um, if you have a curved sidewalk, you can basically cut your first side and then use the uh, the tool to measure out the other side and keep an even uh, an even curve, which is very helpful. So definitely everything from Pave Tool we found to be very helpful. Yeah, they got some good stuff. And and that that brings me back to what we were saying at the beginning of the interview with education and investing into your guys and obviously tools and equipment and being able to invest in that for your guys is not only going to help uh, re employee retention, but also help employee recruitment. And then as a whole, it's going to help this industry because we're making this industry, um, you know, the work look easier, the work look more exciting, the work look so much better. And it's just going to help this industry. So in terms of, I, I know you guys have given uh, a few shout outs already in this interview, uh, in terms of people online that you guys look to and are learning from and, uh, you know, just are following online for lots of great information. Any other people or mentors or people again that you want to give a shout out that you get a lot of inspiration from? I think uh, I like to watch. This guy doesn't have as many followers. I know everybody always goes back to Instagram and this and that, but there's this company called Tussy Landscaping. I don't know if you're familiar with them, and they're they're awesome. Those guys do are you know some really unique work there there's obviously everybody has their own style you know whether it's modern or rustic and I, I like to watch those guys they're super informative they're always doing a lot of cool stuff I don't technically I don't really know them personally um I just enjoy their content because it's edu you know it's pretty educational and they they do things the right way I uh, as far as like the look you know looking up to people I, I, I obviously there's there's lots of mentors out there and um you know I see a lot of design techniques I like realm design I, I watch a lot of people on Instagram uh of course everybody knows about RC outdoors but for me and Jeremy Squire and I'm probably gonna butcher his name even though we're good friends um he is probably the most technical or an advanced guy I know as far as his process I've gained so much knowledge from that guy and tons of people follow him. And I, and I believe he was on uh, your podcast, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, and that guy is just a beast, man. I'm in a masterminds group with him. And, and that's another thing I'll say. If you're not in a group, get in a group, man. Because it is nice to be able to ask somebody their opinion and not feel like you're being judged. Most groups you're going to have to pay for. But, again, it's that investment in yourself. But that guy – is an animal. I mean, he, <laughs> he comes up with ideas and, you know, you can watch his stories and see how innovative he is, but I've stolen forms from him. I've, you know, stolen ideas from him. And, you know, they say that, you know, people say, well, you copied me. No, that's the highest form of a compliment is to copy somebody, you know? So uh, for me, the, I would say that, and he probably doesn't even know I'm going to say this. Uh, I say these things about him, but I, I kind of look up to the way he does things with his squad, as he calls it, and his process. I stole the drone thing from him. He showed me how to import the drone fish pictures and scale them into my program. It's sped up measurements like crazy. So that guy is just an animal. Um, but there, there's so many good guys. Just just get with a group. Like we're in the masterminds group with Imagine, um, which is I've been in it for a very long time. Well, they've only been maybe a year and a half or so, but I've been in it a long time. And just being able to ask questions in a closed group is such a, such a big deal. And I'm sure Kyle will elaborate on people he follows because, you know, we all got our opinions, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't have anyone. I follow a bunch of the same people Jordan does, but I think it's just important to, to look at what other people are doing. And, you know, like Jordan said, steal ideas, uh, share ideas, and just always be looking to, you know, make your installation methods better because if you're not trying to get better, then, uh, then you're not going anywhere. Absolutely. And this uh, brings me to my final question for the two of you. And maybe you both have an answer for this. Maybe you, you uh, have one answer, but, you know, whether it's growing a business, whether it's being on site and installing, we've all learned things throughout this journey that we wish we would have known from the very beginning. 
So my question for you guys is, what is that one thing you wish you'd known from the very beginning when you first started this company? Whether that be Evolve, whether that be uh, Curtech, Lawn Care, whatever it may be, but what is that one thing you wish you'd known from the very beginning? For me, I think the one thing I wish I would have known is how to not devalue myself. This is one of the only industries where we are not seen as true professionals. And I wish I knew the value that I brought to the table now. And I don't mean to say that in an arrogant or a, you know, a cocky way, but the mind is a tool that is irreplaceable. You can do you know, the best quality work, but being creative, being confident, getting the money that you deserve. I'm not talking about overcharging. I'm talking about putting a fair value on yourself for your services. I wish I had learned a long time. I've had a lot of success in this industry. Uh, like I said, Curry Tip Lawn Care, you know, does about 1.7, 1.6, 1.7 million dollars a year, and is very profitable for me. Evolve is doing fantastic, and I've learned a lot of valuable lessons through business. But the one that I wish somebody would have told me is to value yourself more than anything, and 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 that for me is is the biggest thing. I mean, Kyle's maybe different, you know? Yeah, I mean, I agree, and. Uh... Like I said, I think the biggest thing for me is just learning that it's uh, it's you always want to get better and don't don't be scared to try you know try new installation methods, try new techniques. I was I was very uh, actually against switching to open graded base when we started to you know switch over to that, but just seeing that you know trying new methods that you might not be comfortable with or you might think you know don't make sense, it's always worth it to look into them, try new things, and try to you know make yourself a better person and better installer. Amazing guys, and thank you so much for your time. Let our audience know where they can find you guys online if they want to follow along to your journey here. Yeah, um, we are on Facebook and Instagram, uh, Evolve Design Build. We are actually rebuilding our website now um, for Evolve Design Build. We also have our sister company, Curry Tuck Lawn Care, which JR does a fantastic job at managing that company. But um, Kyle also is Evolve Kyle um, on Instagram. Uh, he is a pretty busy guy in the field right now, so he doesn't have as much time to post, and I'm unable to story as much as I'd like. But, uh, Trutz, you know, that's that's the best time. If anybody ever feels like they want to reach out to us for questions, I'm going to tell you, man, Kyle is a phenomenal installer. And if there's new guys out there that have a question, you hit him up on Instagram. I know I'm volunteering him right now, <laughs> but the guy's incredible. He's uh, – I mean, I'm lucky to have him as a partner. And then, you know, if there's anything I can answer for anybody, uh, reach out to me on uh, Evolve Design Build, the actual page, and I'll do my best to help you out.